It's nearly the end of November and winter is approaching, although you wouldn't think that judging by uh, today's weather. It's actually very mild. Now, as well as being interested in growing my own food, I'm also an historian and we can learn an awful lot about how to use our food more effectively and efficiently and how to use our resources more efficiently by looking back through history and there's two periods I'm particularly interested in. One is the Second World War and the other is the medieval period and I've been looking through the history books and looking through the documents and the recipes to find out how people used the cook their food and use their food in those two periods. So in this edition we're going to be having a look at some of what I learned from that. So welcome to Self Sufficient in Suburbia for autumn 2016 with a bit of an historical flavour. One of the classic recipes from the medieval period is pottage. Now I say recipe, there wasn't actually a real hard set recipe that you had to follow. Basically pottage was a cross between what we would know as a soup and a stew nowadays. And it was made from whatever was available and it was eaten in all by all classes of people. Now at the lower end, at the peasant, the, for the peasants, it would be a very watery pottage because they had fewer ingredients to put into it and it would be almost entirely vegetarian whereas the richer people had meat in their pottage and even some spices as well if they were really really rich. So what we're going to have a go at doing in our 21st century kitchen now is to make a pottage which would have been consumed by the richer people in medieval society and that means we're going to be including some meat. Now this is game, It's uh, most of this has already been cooked so in there we've got squirrel, pigeon, rabbit and duck and as I say some of this has already been cooked and that's all going to be chopped to go into the soup, into the pottage as well and we've been storing it in a very 21st century sweet box. As the stock, what we're going to do is add this. This is gelatine and it's been made from pig's trotters. And every part of the pig, indeed every part of any animal that, is, that was slaughtered in the medieval period, was used. No waste at all. And we're going to add in a couple of cabbages. Now these have sort of slightly manky leaves on them. And back in the medieval period, those manky leaves would have just been taken off and fed to the pigs. We're not allowed to do that nowadays because we're not allowed to feed kitchen waste to our animals, to our, to our livestock. It's, it's illegal to do so. It all goes back to the foot and mouth problem that we had over a decade and a half ago. Now, in the medieval period, beans were important. These are beans that have been actually in our freezer for about three or four years, so we're needing to use them up and that they are broad beans. Now beans and peas and pulses were grown very widely. It was a very common crop back in the medieval period. And for people in, in, at the lower end of the social scale it was really important to be consuming beans because you weren't getting meat and the beans and the peas provided you with your protein. And we're also going to be chucking in some uh, some runner beans, some chopped runner beans and A few onions as well. Onions really important, very good for your health, but also important for flavour as well. And we're also going to add in this. These are nutmeg. This is what the very rich would be able to buy. So we're going to put 
one of those, or half of one of those, grated into the pottage. And finally, we're going to add a few herbs, which just come from our herb garden. We've got thyme and some hyssop. I don't know many people who grow hyssop these days, but certainly it was grown in the medieval period. And we've got some dried rosemary to add in as well. Well, as you can see, the gelatine and the stock have now liquefied, so we're going to add in uh, the meat and then the cabbage and the onions and the beans. Now, medieval man would have had the problem of uh, having lots of ice on their beans, but uh, there we go. And the runner beans. I'm going to let that all sort of warm up uh, for a few minutes. I've tied the herbs together but also added in some bay leaves as well. Also I have grated half a nutmeg and these are going to go into the pan now. What we're also going to do is add in more water. So adding in a couple of litres. And then we'll bring that up to the boil. After it came to the boil, we turned the heat down and let it simmer for about an hour and a half. And this is now ready to be served. Here goes. Mm. That's fine. As I said earlier, this was a very common way of cooking what ingredients people had available. As I say, no specific set recipe to this, but really it was just a way to make sure that you had a hot meal. Obviously the richer you were, the more contents in it. Uh, the richer you were, the more animal, um, the more meat you could eat. Uh, remember for medieval people that animals were worth far more to them alive than they were dead. So if you were poor and had animals, you'd want the cattle for milking, the chickens for laying eggs and so on, rather than for killing them for meat. But the richer you were, the more meat you were able to eat and uh, the more spices you're able to add to your food. It is rather good. It's Saturday the 16th of October 2016. We're here at Fuga Bar in Washingwell Woods. And the reason why we're here is we've been unveiling an information board about the history of the area. But we've started off with a little bit of historical cooking by me when I served up pottage to the people who came along for the unveiling of the information board. Before we do the unveiling, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bit of medieval pottage in the pan there. Uh, now, um, what, what we decided to do was create something that would have been uh, eaten at um, William de Fuga's housewarming party here in 1269, uh, and it's a pottage. Uh, now, I'm certain sad to say that uh, it's not a vegetarian, so if you're a veggie, um, well, the, the animals that went into it were all vegetarian, so it kind of helps. Uh, but uh, it, what, 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 what a pottage is, it's basically a, a sort of a cross between a stew and a soup. Uh, and into this one we put uh, some really good medieval recipe, um, ingredients, so we've got big, tr big trotters, we've got squirrel, uh, I'm really just selling this. <laughs> uh, uh, pigeon, um, rabbit, uh, but also beans, because uh, they used to grow lots of beans in those days. And this is a pottage that would have been served up to the rich, because if you were rich, you had meat in those days. If you were poor, you kept your animals alive, because they were worth more to you alive than they were dead. So this is what William de Fuga would have been eating. 
Uh, and it's also got a little bit of nutmeg as well. Uh, so the spices. The hue is huge. Spi yeah, it smells, yeah, it smells I'll, good. I'll, 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 I'm expecting to go home and take this <laughs> back for, for, for dinner today. Uh, but um, back in the medieval period, if you had spices, then you were rich. Uh, the, the poor didn't have it. So most of us would have um, had something like this. We would have had a sort of a watery stew with lots of vegetables and beans in. Uh, so, if anybody wants to have a try, and I'm going to invite uh, the mayor first to, try. Oh, yeah. to um, have a go. This is a feast. <laughs> 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 Medieval version of the Andrew, would you mind <laughs> going along? Good. The right, it's and the the yeah, right. It's got the mayoral of Mam will tell you where it is. The scissors. That's where our factory is. Good. We've only once before had a duck go broody and she only went broody for two days and then abandoned the eggs. Now this is completely the wrong time of year for ducks to be going broody but this one has and she's got eight eggs which she is brooding out in the on the side of the allotment here and uh, we're not really sure what to do with her because the eggs almost certainly won't hatch but I'm tempted to let her continue brooding them just so that we can get the ducks used to actually brooding eggs and hopefully next spring she'll actually brood some eggs properly in the warmer weather. During the war years, the government did everything they could to reduce the amount of food that we were importing by increasing the amount of food that UK farms were producing. Now, one of the problems that they faced was that a lot of food could be wasted on the farms before it ever got to market because of pests and vermin. And wood pigeons were amongst those pests that ate their way through large parts of British crops, particularly grain crops. So farmers were encouraged to have these little critters shot and one shoot could take out hundreds and hundreds of these birds. Now you didn't want to waste these birds, this is game and it has meat on the breasts. And what we're going to do today is have a go at turning this into wartime pigeon sausages. We've got our pigeon breasts there and we're going to add into it some sausage meat. Now if you were a member of a pig club or you kept a pig in your back garden or you're on a farm where you could keep a couple of pigs then that was great you had a supply of pork meat otherwise you would have had to go to the, uh, the butcher for sausage meat and it would have been very limited in supply. Now the other thing about the pork sausage meat is that that's going to give a bit of fat to these sausages as well. Now the other ingredients we're going to use are some cooking apples. These apples came from another food swap that we did uh, recently and we've got onions. During the Second World War onions were in short supply. They were worth their weight in gold and a huge part of the onion crop was grown simply on allotments. And one final, uh, final addition to this recipe is this. This is rowan jelly. Now rowan jelly is really good with game and I made this about three years ago and it's been sitting in my fridge ever since so it's now going to find a new home in the pigeon sausages.
minced up the pigeon breasts and weighed them already so we have 650 grams and this will go into a large mixing bowl. Five hundred grams of sausage meat that goes into the bowl as well. Now the point about wartime sausages is that the it was often the case that the meat content would vary considerably, and uh, in many times people referred to wartime sausages as being toast because there was more breadcrumbs in them than meat. And indeed, when I was listing the ingredients earlier, I forgot to mention that breadcrumbs go into this as well. But we're going to add in 500 grams to our, of sausage meat to our 650 grams of pigeon meat. Next up we have three apples, cooking apples, and two onions. grams of breadcrumbs. Now in the modern world, unbelievably, people actually buy breadcrumbs from the supermarket. You don't need to do that, you just need to dry some bread out and uh, then put it through your liquidizer and it uh, comes out as, as breadcrumbs. Why waste your money on buying it? So we're going to add this in and I've got to say the amount of breadcrumbs would have varied throughout the war and uh, we're adding 200 into this. It may be that uh, people during the war years would have used more, perhaps possibly at times with, with a good uh, supply of uh, pigeon breasts that may have used yet, uh, may have used less, but nevertheless we're going to add 200, 200 grams into the mix. Then we're going to add in just a spattering of black pepper. Uh, this may or may not have been added in during the war, depending on how people were able to get their hands on that stuff. And finally, this was used extensively during the war uh, for all sorts of, to add flavour, simply adding in one and a half teaspoonfuls of salt. And then I'm just going to mix this all together. Well it's partly mixed up now so time for the final ingredient which is the Rowan jelly so we're just going to scoop the whole of this jar into the sausage meat mix. All now thoroughly mixed and we're going to leave this to stand overnight so that the flavours can really blend in together. Well the sausage meat has been standing overnight and what we're going to do now is we're just going to sample a small bit like that. We're going to fry it and sample it to make sure we're happy with the flavour and texture. So here's the little bit of meat that's been frying for a few minutes. I've not sampled it yet but uh, here goes. Actually, that's, that is much better than I expected. Yeah, all right. Pleased with that. So we don't have to alter any of the ingredients now. We don't have to add anything more to it. So these are now ready to be, the meat's now ready to go into the sausage skins. What I would say though is that during the war period, the chances of you having sausage skins were probably quite remote. So you probably would have had sausages without sausage skins, but uh, we're going to take advantage of being in the 21st century and uh, put the sausage meat into skins. So, these are the sausages I've made. Not as good as the sausages I used to do years ago because I'm a bit out of practice with uh, sausage making. Anyway, we've left some of the sausage meat to be made into burgers. Now, the point about this is that pigeon is a pest, uh, but in the wartime years they found a use for it, making it into, or using the, the breast meat 
to make into all sorts of things and sausages was one of them and it's much better than that being thrown out. So effectively a waste product turned into useful meat and a useful food. It's the middle of November now and these are just some of the branches that were fed to the goats during the summer and autumn and as you can see they've now started to strip the bark off them and they really do like the bark. I suspect it's quite nutritious for them but interestingly they never touch the bark in the summer months it's only in the autumn and the winter that they start eating it. Pinky here is quite interested in the twigs that are on the branches as well, so it may take a bit of digesting to get it through them, but uh, it's well worth letting them chew on this stuff. Well here we are in the 21st century, the vast majority of people rely on supermarkets and food manufacturers to get them the food that they consume. What a massive difference that was compared to back in the medieval period where people generally had to be self-sufficient. They produced the vast majority of the food that they ate themselves. There's another key difference between modern day life and medieval life. Nowadays we are unbelievably wasteful, particularly with the food that we consume. Typically a quarter to a third of the food that households buy in supermarkets ends up being wasted, ends up in the bin. What an unbelievable waste that is. But that was not the case back in the medieval period. Everything was squeezed out of the food supply. Nothing was wasted. So what we're going to do today is we're going to show you how, we, how to cook these. These are pig's trotters and actually you get quite a large quantity of usable food from them. So we're after the meat on those hooves but we're also after the gelatine as well because we're making some game pie and we need the gelatine to add to them. In the pan we have four pig's trotters plus some pork belly bones left over from a meal that we had recently and I'm going to add in a litre of stock that we made from boiling up the game that's going into our pies. So here are the bones and the stock. What I'm going to do now is just add water to this so that all the bones are covered. So I'll put the pan back on the cooker and we're going to bring these to the boil. Back in the medieval period those households with their pigs, they would have fattened them up in the late summer and early autumn, which is the period that we're in now. If you had foraging rights in the local woodland, you would have taken your pigs there. Uh, they would have eaten the acorns, the conkers, the hawberries, rose hips and so on. And they would have been fattened up and most of those uh, animals would have been slaughtered in time for the winter. So you had a meat supply over the winter but it also meant that you weren't feeding large numbers of animals over the winter as well when your feed supplies were quite restricted. Not all animals would have been slaughtered. You would have needed some breeding animals for the following year and something such as your ox, which would have been the tractor of its day. Obviously animals like that would have been kept and you would have had to ensure the supply of feed for them to get them through the winter. The pans now come up to the boil and I've turned the heat down, I'm going to let it simmer for at least an hour and a half and I'm going to add in some fresh herbs from the herb garden. The trotters have been simmering away for about two hours. I've taken one of them out of the pan now and what we're looking to do is just see 
how easily the meat falls away from the bones and it's literally it's peeling away quite easily. And that means that the meat is now cooked. So we're going to take the trotters out and we're going to strip the meat from them. We'll let them cool down a little bit because I don't want to get my fingers burned. And then we'll put the bones back in to the pan with the juice there and boil them up for a bit longer to make sure we get all the gelatine out of it. The last time I boiled up pig's trotters to get meat off them, I did get a reasonable amount of meat. Uh, sadly, <laughs> today we've got that little bit there. Now you could be forgiven for thinking that that is a bit of a wasted exercise, but it's not. We're after the gelatine. That's the main reason why we're boiling up those bones. Uh, but what we've also been able to strip from the bones is this. This is the skin and gristle and the sort of little bits of flesh around the um, the ankle bones and that's an extremely important source of fat and indeed what we are planning to do with that is to render it so that we can extract the fat which is basically what happens is we boil it up in water and then we put it through a sieve like we have done here this is from another set of bones that we've been boiling up today and that is a really good source for pig fat for lard and back in the medieval days that would have been used uh, as a source for calories but also the fat can be used for preserving some perishable foods as well. So we've put the bones back into the the liquid in which the trotters were boiled up and we're going to apply heat to these and we're going to let these come back to the boil and then we're going to simmer them for about another hour make sure we squeeze the last bit of gelatine out of there. Now on the back of the cooker here is a pan of the sort of gristle and skin uh, of that we've taken from uh, another part of the pig and that is actually what is being used to make the lard. Well this has now had long enough and it's time to strain it through a sieve. It's now 24 hours since I extracted the gelatine from the pig's trotters and we will know it's worked if the stock that the gelatine was in has set and as you can see it is set as a rather nice jelly. So now that we've got that bit successfully done, what we're going to do is add some of that gelatine to a couple of pies I've made. These are the game pies I was making yesterday as well. And we're going to heat up the gelatine, get it to liquefy again, and then we're going to pour it into the pie. So here we have our two pies and we need a funnel and we simply pour in the gelatine it will be absorbed throughout the pie and then we will let them cool down and the gelatine will set again in the pies. The game pie that we made yesterday has now had 24 hours for the gelatine in it to uh, turn back into a jelly. Uh, so we're going to cut this. <laughs> so, um, didn't all quite come out in one piece, but uh, here goes. Mm. Well, that is lovely. Sadly, the second pie that we had, we put into the a competition here at the Bow Show. 
and um, it didn't win any prizes. Um, however, it'll do well for lunch for us. Cheers. Well that's it for autumn 2016 and we're going to play you out with a clip that we filmed at the Bow Show in County Durham in September and it's because we've had a bit of a history theme to this edition that's the reason why we're going to play you out with the clip from the Bow Show because it's of a set of, it's a historic tractor parade. But really life just get more exciting than that. Join us in the next edition when hopefully the goats will be a bit calmer. Thank you.